Hello. Welcome to worship at Pioneer Congregational United Church of Christ in Sacramento. I'm Pastor Bill Pfeifferfoot. I'll be beginning my ministry as your interim pastor on April 1st. I look forward to joining Pioneer on its journey toward the, its next called pastor. Easter Sunday will be my first day in the pulpit. <laughs> see Jesus. We come to worship, to pray, and learn. We come looking for Jesus in scripture lessons, in our own life experiences, in helping our world, in prayers for each other. We seek to follow in the way of Jesus. May our Lenten journey lead us to Jesus so that we may show forth Jesus in our lives, our faith community, and our world. Hello friends, how are you doing today? I hope you have been able to both get outside when you can and be able to observe the awesome power of mother nature, safe and warm from inside. It's very important for us to be outside sometimes and, and be in nature. The wind, the trees, the flowers, the other plants, the sunshine, and all the living creatures that we experience when we're outside they speak to us. Now, not actually talk to us, but they communicate with us, with the us that's inside our body. When we see storms, lightning, powerful rain, hail, similar to what we saw the other day, it can be both scary and exciting. Now, scary because we don't know exactly what's happening or how long it's going to last or what damage the storm is going to do or how that's going to affect our lives or the shelter that we live in. But storms can also be exciting because they're not something that we see or hear very often. And events that don't happen very often have a, a novelty or a newness effect on our brain. They're very powerful and strong. And combined with being a bit scary, storms and things like that often makes our body and our brain excited. Do you have your learning partner with you? Now, remember, if you don't have one actually with you physically, you do still have someone who is always listening. 
our creator. So whether it's a parent, a pet, or God, turn to your learning partner and tell them one or two things that you feel are scary, but exciting. Now, many people might think of roller coasters, but you may have thought of a particular movie or a fast car ride, or maybe for you older children, skydiving or bungee jumping, maybe climbing really high in a tree or jumping off of a moving swing or spinning around and around and around on a merry-go-round that someone else is pushing. All of these and more are situations where we are somewhat in control, but not completely. We can wear a seat belt in a car or on a roller coaster. We can decide how high we want to climb in the tree or when to do the jump off of the swing, but we can't control everything. A branch we think is strong may break or someone else could be driving their car and not watching where they're going. Or we may not land as smoothly as we had hoped after jumping off of the swing. But that's a risk we take when we decide to do something that's a little bit scary. But it shows us that we can do something challenging, something that's not comfortable and still be us afterwards. And afterwards, not only are we still us, we're even more us because we've learned something that we can do the scary but exciting thing. Now, part of one of today's readings comes from John 12, after Jesus talks to some Greeks that asked to see him. And after reading what Jesus said to them, I believe that he basically told them, if you don't ever do any scary but exciting things in your life, you haven't completely become the whole you that I know you can be. Now, when you read it, you may think he was trying to say something else, but here's what I know that he didn't say. He didn't say that we all have to do the same scary but exciting things. Each of us gets to discover what our things are. For some of us, talking with a new person is scary, and for others, not so much. Some of us love roller coasters, and some do not. Some want to climb really high in a tree, or go in a pretend haunted house, or drive a car really fast but not everyone wants to do those things. And that's what makes us all so unique. We are all humans, but we are humans in different ways. Jesus had to do something really, really scary. And others couldn't see how it was exciting at all. He was the only one who could see that in some ways it was exciting because he knew that when the scary thing was over, not only would he be the best that he could be, that others would then be able to see how great they could be, because God would be with them, always. Jesus was very scared, troubled, as it were, and he said to them, now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. He meant he wants everyone to know how great God is. We have had to deal with a scary thing with this pandemic. And we are now coming to a point where we can sort of see how this pandemic that has kept us physically apart from each other, kept us out of our classrooms, theaters, restaurants, and for some people, even grocery stores, it wasn't just scary, 
but it it can be exciting because we will now have the opportunity to really appreciate our doctors and nurses, firefighters and police officers, classmates and teachers, and say thank you to them, as well as to those who entertain us in theaters, serve us in restaurants, grow and deliver our food, because we now realize more than ever how necessary all of those things are for us to make us the best us we can be. But we can also now do something that is scary, but exciting. We can work together to make some changes in our schools, in our hospitals, our businesses, our police systems, our communication systems, so that everyone can be the best human they can be, not just some of us. One of my favorite musicals is called Into the Woods. And there's a character that sings a song called, I Know Things Now. And she talks about how the woods can be scary, but exciting. And she says, though scary is exciting, nice is different than good. And before the pandemic for many people, but not everyone, things were nice. As we come to this after the pandemic, we need to work together to make sure that things are not just nice, but good for everyone. Even if doing that thing may be scary. Know that you can do some scary but exciting things to help make that happen because our creator is with us even when it's scary. See you soon. Our first reading is from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more.
Our second reading comes from John 12, 20 through 33. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. scripture lesson from John's Gospel is out of place. It occurs after next Sunday's Palm Sunday parade is over, perhaps on that Sunday afternoon or early in Holy Week. A little over a week earlier, Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb. The word that Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead is spreading and crowds are following Jesus around Jerusalem. Among them are persons described as some Greeks, probably non-Jewish believers in God from outside Palestine who have come for Passover in the holy city. They approach Philip, one of Jesus' disciples, and tell him that they want to see Jesus. 
I expect they're curious if this Jesus is another of the many so-called miracle workers who deceive hapless persons seeking impossible cures by picking their pockets. Maybe they're truly wondering if just maybe there's something to this holy man from Nazareth in Galilee. This isn't the first time in John's Gospel that persons who are not Jewish have interacted with Jesus and come to believe in him. The woman at the Samaritan well realizes that he's a prophet as he describes her life in detail. A royal official, probably meaning a representative of Caesar, seeks Jesus out to heal his son. But this time is different in Jesus' mind. When Philip and Andrew bring word to Jesus that these Greeks are coming to meet him, Jesus understands that the hour has come. Everything that was before is over, and now it's time for him to face the cross. It's curious to me, but John never shows us the Greeks actually meeting Jesus. It's enough for us to know that they want to see Jesus. It's enough for Jesus to know that his message is no longer confined to his kindred people. God is now revealing the message of salvation to the world. Unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John's Gospel has very few parables. But in response to this inquiry by the Greeks, Jesus tells a short one. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. On one level, Jesus is saying that the spreading of the word is only accomplished when a kernel of grain is planted. But on another, he's saying his death will be the beginning of new life. Jesus then expands this beyond himself to all believers. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. I've never been comfortable with the idea that we must hate our lives. But this isn't exactly what Jesus says. We must hate our lives in this world. And by in this world, I don't think Jesus means here in the Central Valley. I think he means our life as part of the system that's represented by, represented by repressive ways of life. We need to die to the evils of the world that it clings so closely to so that we can bring the good news that there is a better way. The Greeks want to see Jesus, but Jesus says the real Jesus will be revealed in a few days on the cross and in the empty tomb. He challenges them, he challenges us, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. The Greeks may have been seeking to see the man Jesus about whom they've been hearing stories of teaching and healing. But Jesus shows them the real human one who is willing to suffer and die to bring life to the world. The Greeks may have wanted to become Jesus' students to add a new bit of philosophy to their lives or to confirm that the Jewish God is superior to Greco-Roman idols. But Jesus tells them that only those willing to lose their lives are destined for eternal life. The Greeks may have wanted to listen to beautiful words from Jesus, but Jesus tells them true life is about removing the stain of a world that denies other persons their humanity and turning to a life of service to God and to others. And God will honor them for this. Jesus is aware that he's asking a lot of his followers and potential followers. It's troubling to him as well. He knows that he could ask God to make the path easier but know the hour has come. 
and that means Jesus must face the cross. Those who've come to see Jesus hear something. Uh, the, the, the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible says, a voice from heaven, but sound is a better translation. Uh, some think it's thunder. Uh, others believe it's an angel. John gives us the meaning of the heavenly sound, but it's unclear who hears those thunderous noises as words. In the booming, God acknowledges that the name of the Lord, that is God's self, is glorified and will be again. This is where Jesus makes clear that hating our life in the world doesn't mean hating living. When I'm raised, Jesus says, the ruler of this world will be driven out and I will draw everyone to me. All the evils that currently rule the way of life as we live it will be vanquished and in unity all humanity will draw together by the cross life and love are offered to those who follow the way of Jesus it's hard for us to imagine how horrifying this sound must have sound to those who were gathering around Jesus in Jerusalem they're aware that Golgotha is just outside the city walls. At that very moment, there could well be prisoners hanging on crosses, dying painful deaths at the hands of the oppressive Roman Empire. The idea that anything good can come from the misery of a cross is impossible for them to grasp. But the hour has come Jesus tells them, to see that what to them seems the way of death is indeed the only real way to life. Writing 600 years before Jesus, the prophet Jeremiah has a vision of a new covenant that the Lord will establish between God and humanity. Rather than religion carrying them, Jeremiah believes that people's faith will carry them. Rather than God's word being written on scrolls, Jeremiah insists it will be written on the heart. The prophet says no one will need to seek the Lord, for everyone from least to greatest will already know God. The Greeks tell Philip, we want to see Jesus. Jesus' answer is, there is a way for people to see him. It's for people to see Jesus reflected in each of us. When we are Christ's body, no one needs to seek Jesus. For everyone from least to greatest will already know the Lord. This past week, I found a link to one of the most interesting articles on church life I've read in a long time. 12 Bad Habits Pastors Dropped During the Pandemic That We Shouldn't Pick Back Up by Carl Vaders spells out the positives of church life during this past year of separation. Vaders says there are 12 things we must not pick back up. One, a focus on the church building. Two, an obsession with attendance and numerical increase. Three, thinking that we have a clue about what's coming next. Four, not paying attention to what's coming next. Five, not pacing ourselves. Six, ignoring our health, families, and souls. Seven, not equipping the church. Eight, expecting anything to be business as usual. Nine, hanging on to dead programs. 10, a longing for the past. 11, an obsession with being trendy. And 12, taking anything for granted. A clergy friend of mine said that there's nothing new in any of that list. They've been said many times before. And, and I agree. But for the first time, we've had to live what we long have been taught. We have had to be church without doing the stuff that we often call 
church, in a place we usually call the church. We have had to find that we are still church, without a bunch of the trappings that we often believe are what define us as a congregation. When Jeremiah talked about what faith can look like, when Jesus showed the Greeks what faith can look like, neither said anything about the building the church was going to be gathered in, neither said anything about counting how many people are in the pews each week, neither said anything about how many suppers and concerts and bake sales we should hold. What Jeremiah and Jesus did say is, we must keep our eyes open open, see where God wants us to be and how God wants us to live with each other. As the pandemic hopefully begins to wind down over the next weeks and months, may we spend more time seeing Jesus and less time worrying about whether the church is going to survive. May we spend time, more time being Jesus for each other and less time obsessing that we lost a year. Then we will be able to open ourselves to Jesus' outstretched arms from the cross as he gathers us together as God's faithful people. Amen. Let us turn our hearts to God. God of faith, during the final days of his earthly life, Jesus offered prayers and supplications to you with loud cries and tears. In faithful obedience, he opened the way to our salvation. We open our hearts to bring before you our deepest needs and concerns. We pray for all leaders and peoples, by the power of Christ's cross, drive out all violence, domination, and injustice in our world. We pray for our war-ravaged world. Teach us to walk together in your way of righteousness and peace. We pray for a world weary from more than a year of the coronavirus. We are grateful for the advance of science that is bringing vaccines to people. We pray for healthcare workers trying to get this life-saving injection to persons. Open those who are reluctant to understand that we will only defeat the pandemic when COVID-19 is stopped. We pray for those who are ill, those who have died, and those who have lingering symptoms. We pray for the poor, the terrified, and the oppressed. We remember those who are alone or, because of the virus, have been separated for months from loved ones. May all find your comforting arms. Hear now the silent prayers we offer to you.
through Christ, with Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we glorify you, Almighty God, with everlasting thanks and praise, using the words Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Before our announcements today, we would like to thank Pastor Bill Pfeiffer Foote for leading us today in worship. We appreciate all of the ministers and lay people who have been filling our pulpit, acting as readers, and providing the children's message during our time of transition to our new interim pastor. A reminder that we have a fellowship hour each Sunday at 11.30 via Zoom. You should have received the link in the weekly email. If you did not receive the link or would like to be invited, please write to the email that you see on your screen, jimjordan at pioneerucc.org. Pastor Bill is our new interim minister and his official start date is Easter Sunday, April 4th. But we got a chance to hear him today and we will have a time of meet and greet during the fellowship hour at 1130. We are pleased to announce a virtual concert in this year's performances at Pioneer Series. This afternoon, March 21st at 3 p.m., you can enjoy Faith Volrath, harpsichordist, in a YouTube premiere live presentation. You should have received a link. Again, if you did not receive the link, you can find it at www.pioneerucc.org. Next Sunday, March 28th, we will enjoy the ministry of Reverend Chris Pfeifferfoot. Pastor Chris is the spouse of our new interim minister, Pastor Bill, and we have enjoyed her ministry several times during our time of transition. And finally, we sincerely thank you for your constant and faithful support of Pioneer Church during this time. The daily ministries of the church go on, and we thank you for your continuing support in both tithes and offerings. Thank you. 
Jesus said, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Go in peace to love and serve Christ. Amen. <laughs>